occasion this finale if you will jimmy lemke welcome again, let's uh, sir. let's let's take this dog out back and i believe just... you said that in the start of the first episode but hey but then hey. we didn't take the dog out back well you obviously didn't because obviously yeah um yeah jimmy you can find on twitter at Hur- uh, you can't, you can't. jimmy you can find on twitter at jimmy lemke uh, you can find us on Twitter at Horizon RT. Um, actually, you can find that you can find all our socials on at horizonroundtable.com slash subscribe. Um, it be a patron. Patreon.com patreon.com slash horizon roundtable. You can get a nice mug. Very nice. It's a five dollar level. Um, you can pull us up wherever podcasts are found. And of course, uh, well, Jimmy, we started off uh, talking about how Damien. Uh, we ended last episode talking about how Damien Nurgle was the shit from like however many years ago. Oh, I ago. love Damien Nurgle. Always love Damien. Yes. Ergel. So, um, the the ex Young Stoughton State star there. So, uh, um, I feel like we need to obviously before uh, before we get too far into the weeds, let us uh, reintroduce all of our uh, all of our fans for this final soiree. We'll start once again with John. John. <laughs> Hey everybody, John Durda. Um, graduated twice from Cleveland State. Huge Cleveland State fan. Uh, excited for the season coming up. Go Vikes! Yeah, I think we All can. Right. I think we can just do names in schools, right? Yeah, we can do that too. So, yeah, next up is the. I don't want to uh, hear order. more from Reg. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to, sir. You have to. Um, I want to hear more from and, and Shane. How dare you preempt the, the preempt the interest of the one true uh, Kyle Craven? Before you leave, you need to introduce yourself, sir. He's gonna run away. Oh with, yeah, with, sorry. Yeah. sorry. Um, <laughs> Kyle Kyle Craven from Norse Report. Um, I do have to like I said in the chat. I do have to hop off a little early this time, but I can stick around for maybe the first fifteen minutes of the episode. Hey, yep. how about this? When he's done introducing people, you're going to be the first person who gets to call somebody out and shit talk them. Is that I, where we're? Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, there we go. All right, so let's let's roll through this. The one true Jim is Jim Saro at Green Bay. Introduce yourself, sir. Hey, it's uh, Jim Saro, and now that episode one is done, where we talked about those who didn't uh, choose to defend themselves, I'm looking forward to uh, talking a little smack about those who did join and are willing to stand up for their team. There you go. All right. Uh, next up, we got Harsh from Oakland. Hello. Uh, I think I'm I'm Harsh. I'm from Oakland University. I think I'm the only one here who's still currently a student at the university that I'm representing. Uh, really proud to be here and uh, go Grizzlies. All right. And then, of course, we got Shane representing uh, Wright State. Hey, guys. I'm back from Wright State and look forward to talking about the Nutter Center and all sorts of things Wright State. Let's do this. And last but not least, the aforementioned Reeves representing Youngstown State. Yeah, uh, Reeves Ryan, uh, class of 2003. Go Gwens. All right. Well, well, Kyle, um, you know, obviously you have a representative from uh, what seems to be uh, Northern Kentucky's long, uh, long, well, most recent and most popular rivalry, Wright State, um, who, as of this recording, may or may not have Tanner Holden back. Yeah, I saw that. Um, I, don't, I don't know, man. I don't have a lot of, like, negative – I know this is crazy to say, but I don't have a lot of negative beef with Wright State right now. In a weird, like, in a weird way, honestly. I think My, I think that's the shit talk right there. Is that you don't care about them right now? I think I think you, <laughs> I think you might be right. No, I, I I would say out of all the teams represented on this call, the one that I probably have the biggest axe axe to grind with is probably Youngstown State. For two years in a row, just taking away one of our one of our uh, <laughs> players. 
Big men right. specifically. Okay, so we meanwhile, meanwhile, Darren Horn is coaching other players. Yeah, but we're no, but listen, but we're doing it to every team in the league. They're just targeting us. Like this is bullshit. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Like we're spreading the wealth. <laughs> we're helping all these other players get out of every program in the league. They're just taking our guys. I'm, I mean, I'm I'm just shocked that there is even you know interconference transfers like that. Like to me, I don't I oh, just yeah. don't get like how players themselves are like, yeah, no problem. <laughs> Aren't you picking up a couple of people from other schools? Um, for the transfer portal, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, it's so funny, like with the portal, like so many of these guys are just question marks because there's always a reason why they're in there, whether it's for, you know, uh, behavioral attitude issues or they're blocked or it's, you know, coaching change. You never know. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I know absolutely nothing about the seven footer from Northern Kentucky and every Gwen fan I talk to is always like, well, we absolutely were obliterated with uh on the boards you know towards the end of the season when cr in crunch time and we are one of the worst shot blocking teams in the entire conference so going out and getting another seven footer that means there'll be two on the roster next year i mean that's hopefully is the uh, elixir to our inability to stop the horizon league the horizon league has had a shit history with seven footers Yes. I mean, um, you, Alec I, Brown says it sends Alec, his regards. This is I was uh, except for Alec Brown. Jim, let me talk, man. Literally, <laughs> I can't think of anybody before or since Alec Brown who was a legit seven footer who had any real impact in the conference. I can't even think of one. I I, I just I can't like Moses Bull was just here. He did like nothing. He, he blocked some shots. He had some stretches, but he wasn't like an all conference. He wasn't even a starter. So I, I just I don't I understand get it. where you're, I understand where you're coming from, Jimmy. Like if you're a seven footer and you're in the Horizon League, there's probably maybe some development you need to be working on. But I will just say, if my choice is having a seven footer and my other choice is not having a seven footer. I'm going to choose to have a seven footer. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, I, I still think this, I, is this how you say his name? Zorgval? Yeah, Emmanuel him, Zorgval. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like I, the only reason he's transferring, I mean, if I had to take a guess is that he, he just went on the line and is like, Oh shit. They only had 94 blocks last year. <laughs> um, they need a center and just, he, I mean, it's instant playing time yeah, just because of he, just because he's tall. You can well, think of it this way. I know something about the Z man. Um, if I may, Kyle, is that he doesn't, from sitting on the bench this year, he did not watch uh, any of NKU's games because he is perfect to replace Chris Brandon and right, not, right. Ta not taking that opportunity. But I actually think that the guy that you got, Kyle, uh, from Marquette is probably a better fit for what you needed um, to replace Chris Brandon than what the Z-Man would have oh, been. Oh, without a doubt. I'm, I'm extremely excited about what we got at the time. That, um, and it's, by the way, it's I-Man. You can just call him I-Man. Um, that's what they all called him around here. But, um, he, I was really disappointed when he left, obviously, but we replaced him with, you know, when you combine Kean from Marquette and Cade Meyer from Green Bay. Um, yeah, I think we're in a pretty good spot, but by the way, if you want to know more about like why Zorgval hit the portal, you can hit me up in the DM. Um, not going to talk about it here though. Oh, for sure. Yeah, but um, uh, it's that's, that's everything with the transfer portal. All these guys are enigmas until you actually get to see them on your team. Exactly. Indeed, they are. Uh, so, uh, Jim, do you have any do you have any words to, to weigh in on uh, on Cade Meyer jumping to Northern Kentucky? My understanding is that you know Cade left because. Uh, you know, he'd put two years into trying to rebuild the program and you only get four years to play. And, you know, going from the team that tied for last to one of the top teams in the league is just a good move for him. Um, you know, it'll be interesting oh, to see yeah. how he did. Yeah. I'll be interested to see how he develops and you know, he does a lot of things really well. He, he doesn't necessarily have like the modern floor spacing for a big man. He's not the greatest outside shooter, but guy plays hard and, uh, you know, mixes it up inside. He's got, you know, he's got a little game. I wish him all the best, but yeah, I mean, for him, he went from a rebuilding Green Bay team to a perennial power at the top of the league. I don't see him uh, beating out uh, Kean from Marquette for the starting spot, but that's uh, that's just my opinion. Um, can we talk about how every time I turn around, somebody's comparing him to Loud and Love? 
Oh, God. Yeah, yeah, what is this loud and love vibes thing? Because he's like stacked and because like... I've I've literally heard I, I think I've heard more than one I've heard one more than one play by play guy compare Cave Meyer to Loud and Love. Greg Greg Straw did that during the IUPUI game, and literally five minutes later, Vince Vincent Brady posterized him. So also, that didn't go over very well. Also, um, every time you hear about like every time you hear about like Canadian basketball people saying, oh, this school got a, a crazy steal. It's because they're selling Canadian basketball. There's I can't I, I, if I had a dollar for every time a Canadian basketball player got a scholarship, you know, at a at a mid major and then all the mid all that school's fans go crazy for a guy and he turns out to not do jack shit. It's just so, it's 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 so common. So we're having two loud and love conversations at the same time, which is weird because it's not 2019 anymore. But we've got no. the Cade Meyer loud and love comparison, which is inaccurate because, you know, no. loud yeah. is just physically overwhelming. And then we've got the Jacob Antak loud and love comparison going on because Jacob is built like a brick shit house and uh, plays super hard. Um, but yeah, yeah I, I was that, wondering where the Canadian thing goes. That went way over my head, man. Yeah, yeah. I was I was trying to make a check. Who compared? Okay, okay. You guys mentioned it, but I gotta know. Like, I understand if you look at the shot chart data on Cade Meyer and you compare it to Loud and Love. Okay, there's there's a there's an actual comparison there. But if you watch like five seconds of tape on Meyer, his footwork down low, like, is it, that resembles to me more of like Drew McDonald, that, without the three point shooting, obviously. But just the, I'm talking about the footwork. Then. Loud and love, loud and a love. poor, a poor man's Drew McDonald too. Okay, okay, fine, but I'm just, I'm saying, like, I'm saying, one guy is like a, like, I don't want to say a finesse post player, but like he's, he's got a lot more footwork to his game. Loud and love was Shaq. Like, if you're in his way, he's gonna push you out of the way and dunk on you, basically. I mean, yeah. not loud and love dunking on you, but you know what I mean. Oh no, so it's just, a, it's a weird comparison to me. That, that, that's all I'm trying to say. No, I get that. I just thought that was, I, I I just I just heard that once and I was like ah, that doesn't really make any sense. And Cade Meyer is Cade Meyer and yeah uh, and I, I do think he's probably gonna this he's probably gonna be a rotational guy as a, in, at Northern Kentucky as opposed to what he was at Green Bay. So I, I do believe that's gonna be what happens to him. I, yeah, I, I was think, I, 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 I yeah. Go ahead. Last, oh sorry, I was just gonna say this will be the last time I weigh in on Northern Kentucky stuff unless someone addresses me on it, but. Basically, I see it as we have like I think six starters for our team, and you can only start five. But I expect that if, if whether it's Cade coming off the bench, whether it's Kean coming off the bench, whether it's you know someone else coming like returning coming off the bench, you're, you're going to have probably six guys for Northern getting like 24 to 28 minutes a game, and Cade will probably be one of those guys. More than likely. More than likely. No. So. I guess I should probably I want to segue because we talk about, you know, we, we we've talked about we talked about this this time last year where you could kind of throw a blanket in the top half of the conference. And I feel like that's going to be the case again this year. I know everybody's still kind of filling out their rosters, completing, you know, Milwaukee still has a scholarship to you know fill out. And, you know, you know we do to hopefully you know, get somebody who has size. Oh yeah, well, I mean, it has to, and and to Bart Lundy, he said it would have to be. Uh, he's looking at it for an all league caliber kind of guy like that. So he is definitely going to be very picky. It seems. Um, I think it's a ready made spot. Yeah. So, yeah. but you then you have Youngstown State who looks like you know they just they did they're not rebuilding they're reloading. Um, then you got you know Northern Kentucky again. <laughs> if you, it's really easy when you're able to build around guys like Marquez Work and Sam Vinson, and then you bring in who you had brought in. I feel like, and you guys can weigh in on this, it feels like we're going to have a blanket around that top six again, and I'm going to have a hell of a time predicting who's going to finish on top. I mean, I, I would I would say don't count, count anybody out. No. I, I, I mean, I, I, maybe IUP, why? But I've, I've, the kid that they pulled on the other day is not bad. Uh, he's not a bad player. No. Uh, the problem is they just need like six more guys before they've got a real program. Um, I think you're confusing them for Detroit Mercy, but go on. Also, De well, Detroit, you know, the thing about Detroit, 
the guys who are on the roster today probably not going to be on there tomorrow. They're going to or come fall. So some of them, some of them will be there, some of them won't. It's just always what Detroit Mercy does. There's always been attrition. They were they were Detroit Mercy was was uh, was in on the transfer portal before anybody else was. They're trendsetters. Well, they had to be because do you remember, remember 2018 where were they? They were they hired Mike Davis what in June of that year? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, they were a little late to the game, so they didn't really have too much of a choice. And I, uh, I, I'm, in, I'm innocent, damn it. <laughs> I've done nothing wrong. Anyway. So, okay, but, I want to talk to Shane, because I want to talk yes. about, uh, I want to talk about why, like, what is it about Wright State that Lisa? Billy Donlin can't get over the hump and now... And now Nagy can't seemingly get over the hump, but they're always relatively close or very close. And for some reason, that's still not good enough. And Nagy actually went to a tournament last year. Yeah. And all of us and the Wright State fans seemingly just hate the guy. And I just don't get it. Uh, I've not. I've not had a lot of experience with Maggie Hate since he's been, took us to the tournament twice in what five five years now, right? Um, but like he is set in his ways, and that's the big kickback I get in from people who don't like Maggie is he uh, he won't call timeouts when the other team's on a scoring run. You guys know that more than anyone when we lost yeah. that tournament game not too long ago to you guys. <laughs> uh, that was brutal. Um, yeah, you should have been in the gym. It was beautiful. <laughs> and then, of course, we we went around and we lost you guys last year as well, too. That was a really smart plan on your guys' uh, coach to put you in the small gym, smaller gym. It worked out really well. It was the loudest. It was the loudest building I've ever been in my life. I yeah. I I've, I never realized. It, it's got these people. It's got some of these people who never talked about it or are always talking against it considering maybe a move and you did to campus exactly but, what you guys had to do to beat us was was get out of the head early and that's we sucked last year when playing from behind so it's a terrible idea to move from the house that kareem built to a gym that wasn't even built for intercollegiate athletics <laughs> like that gym was built specifically for intramurals and student recreation that was not built for college basketball, let alone like division one college basketball. So it's like some of these people who like want the noise, like sure, build a, th- build a 4,000 seat arena on campus. If you, if you can, but if you can't like let it go, like this is just the, the Kalachi center is not that fucking place. Oh, well, yeah. Hey, you know, for Wright State, I've uh, like that naggy hate. I feel like a lot of it is born out of the stubbornness about how he coaches and how he handles the portal. And then, like it or not, there was a lot of negativity around how much money he was making for, you know, compared to other needs at the school. Yeah. I actually wonder if uh, Darren Horn taking over the title as highest paid guy in the league will actually bring a reprieve of some of that hate to uh, Scott Nagy or not, because people were definitely like thinking, hey, we're paying all this money. We're not winning every year, even though he's been to the tournament two times in his uh, seven years at Wright State and has three conference um, championships or ties for conference championships in the rise. Like he's doing what he's getting paid to do. But I feel yeah. like there's maybe unrealistic expectations because he was making 500 grand and now he's not the highest paid guy anymore. Like the bar is going to move past him not financially, at least. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is that everyone's not real happy with him on the transfer portal. I think he's going to get a buy this year. Uh, all the rumors are true. We are getting Tanner Holden back, um, but I wouldn't even say that was his doing. That was just kind of um, Ohio State's coach is terrible over there and they kind of delivered Tanner back to us but um and that's a big going to be a big aspect moving forward I mean it's great you can get guys out of high school but you know you redshirt them all you know I don't I don't know if his ways is is going to be good moving forward or not it's still kind of waiting to see last year was his worst record in conference we went 500 that's not not, not a great look um 
Uh, and we're bringing uh, of all the years to be running it back, we're we're running we're pretty much running it back from off, based off of last year. So I think the other thing with yeah, I think the other thing with Wright State, and this has always been uh, to to your point about Nagy's you know coaching style. He always has run a really short bench, and this last season seemed to be the season where it kind of bit him in the ass. Yeah. Where he kind of shortened up his bench and it cost him because those guys pretty were pretty gassed at the end. Yeah, well, I thought it was did. interesting that they really did not use Amari Davis down the stretch. Like Amari Davis seemed like an afterthought for that program, and he has some capability where you know he's going to use Tanner Holden. Like you have to look at Holden, Calvin, and Noel. Uh, Noel, like that's not ten and ten in this league. That's better than ten and ten in uh, in the Horizon League in my mind. I think Wright State's on their way back up a little bit. Yeah, I think we I think we definitely improved this year. Um, I would not be surprised if we don't see much Amari again this year. I just I don't think he's a currently like a great fit for what the roster is right now. Um, I think I think four of our five guys have already started are all decided. I think you're going to see Calvin Holden, Noel, and Braun, and then we got to find a shooting guard. And I haven't really seen it my fate my best guard that we've had for that position it was von duggan and i don't think we've had a great one since then i hope hope uh one von of the guys really up this year. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a long time since we had a guy that could really shoot slides out from behind the oh, three I'm th- i think about von duggins and i think that there was that was the guy who really the horizon league guy you thought was in college for 14 years <laughs> Yeah, he's just like Vaughn Duggins is still fucking there. What the hell? I thought yeah. he graduated four years ago. Just because well, he was he was a impact guy from day one. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I think the other thing, yeah, and and by the way, hopefully, I really do hope they do announce this. Uh, do announce that uh, Tanner Holden is in fact coming back to uh, Wright State um, before we're done recording. <laughs> you know, before this co- this episode comes out. That would be nice, and then we're like sitting over here. I like, think oh, uh, still sitting over here, waiting over here, waiting over here, waiting over here. You want everybody to be better, right? I mean, yeah. that's that's the thing. No, that, that's, that gets us that is the whole. Well, yeah, that is the whole thing, and I think uh, I'm glad you brought that up because it is. And you've all heard me say this many, many times, and to the point where it's cliche, and I sound stupid. Where we are, oh, we we are incrementally at points where is this going to be the year that the horizon league gets better that it's going to be collectively better is it going to be you know i i did i say it last this year? year definitely was yeah this year definitely I mean, was so i'm gonna say this and i think this yeah i think this this upcoming season it has to be better it has to be better you have i, I mean Top to bottom, I think we are. I think we are finally at a point. And of course, the second I say this, shit's gonna hit the fan again. <laughs> that we are at a point where the league is finally better. I guess we won't. We won't really know until we hit the non-conference. I think that's where the rubber meets the road. We can beat. I mean, these teams can beat the shit out of each other in conference, but if they're not doing well outside of the conference, I, not I being point, teams they're not supposed to be do, beating. I want to then, point point a specific stat out when you're done. I mean, un- unless unless we get to that, we we finally get to that point where we're. We're we're beating the teams that uh, you know, the, uh, these teams are beating the team uh, the the these non conference foes that they're supposed to be beating. I, I don't know if I can make that prediction, <laughs> but I'm gonna do it anyway because that's what I do every year because yeah. I'm stupid. Hey Jimmy, before you give your stat, I just want to chime in on something with this. So, if you look last year, if there was nine teams in the league that didn't do terrible in conference. You know, nine and eleven was the ninth place team and then obviously green bay and iupui yeah, didn't right. do yeah i mean didn't do anything iupui uh-huh. the guy they got from buffalo looks pretty good but on the whole you could say if you're just running back what you have you're gonna need a lot of organic growth and they haven't really brought a lot in this off season so it's hard to you know feel like they're on the right track yet green bay though is going to do a couple of things here like they brought in two major players that are going to make an impact in this league and they are also uh not scheduling i've used the term on the, this podcast before like a horse's ass they are not going to be scheduling like a horse's ass anymore i've seen their schedule they're not going to have five by games and you know 
put themselves in a spot where they're sitting at 335 in the uh, Ken Palm or the net right out of the gate. So I feel like Green Bay is actually going to do their part to get back to where they belong. But when you bring in a player like Noah Reynolds, that is a yeah. top five player in this league. Man, no they are it. so uh, – talk about the incredible luck of Wisconsin getting A.J. Storrs. And, and basically through that, the I, I encourage anybody to read the article about Noah Reynolds. Was it Scott Vensey who wrote it? Yes. It was, it was, it's an incredible article. It's a great feature. Reynolds basically got like they they ghosted him at Madison, and he's talking to AJ Stores, and AJ Stores like, oh, I talk to the coaches every day. Wow. So you know, imagine our luck as a conference to have a player. You know, I mean, and, and he's not going to like tip the scales on his own. Like it's it's uh, any school, it's a team effort, but like. To get like such a good player, because the school that they that was initially recruiting him and got a, his commitment could not maintain a, a commitment, a basic commitment. It's it, you, it's incredible. And that article did a nice job of featuring other programs that had reached out to him. And I actually talked to his brother last week. His brother's on the coaching staff at Green Bay. It's actually a fun fact. Three coaches recruited Noah Reynolds, according to verbal commits. Uh, three coaches recruited him out of high school, and all three of them are on the Green Bay staff. So, you know, getting him is no uh, coincidence. Obviously, his brother's there. You know, Coach Wicks is there. And then, so uh, was Pat Monaghan the one, the other one? No, he had a Winona State offer, and we have one of the Winona State assistant coaches, uh, Zach is his name. And so that, you know, their, their effort to get Noah runs deep, but he is a legitimate top five player in the league. And then you bring in Rich Byrie, who's coming from D2. He's a D2 All-American, six, you know, six nine two forty. 240. It was Rockhurst, um, right? Yeah, yes. He was in Kansas City with the uh, – one of the Diener brothers was coaching or Diener boys was coaching him. Drew. Yes. And so he's inside outside scorer, uh, huge body, like green Bay's offense is going to be significantly uh, less painful to watch this year than it had been the last couple of years. And um, you know, then they're not going to schedule as many ball games. They're going to play a lot more mid majors. You know, the they're in an MTE with Southern Utah and Montana state, both who have, new coaches, one of whom is uh, familiar to Horizon fans. They just have a better opportunity to win this year and really bring their program back. So I just want to, when you're thinking about the league, there's probably 10 teams that aren't going to be trash. And um, IUPUI as a wild card, they very well through organic growth could be a lot better too. So Bob, I'm with you. This is definitely the year. It may not be the year that we get every fan to talk about their team, but damn it, this is the year we're going to not stink. Good, because it is incumbent on Green Bay not to suck next year. Because Green Bay has a and, – and by the way, if you have not heard the Sonny Wicks interview we had – and by the way, when, are, when is when is Fear the Phoenix going to have him on? You guys got to get I him talk, on. Yeah, so I, I talked to him about it I mean, last that, week. I mean, you will not regret that. No, I talked to him about it. I was just waiting for them to get all their players so that he could kind of give us a, you know, in depth of like, what do people do? Like the way that they describe, I won't steal the terminology that they use, but they signed a guy named Elijah Jones, who's from uh, Juco. Yeah. And uh, the terminology that they use to describe his position on the court is uh, hilarious because it's, you know, people is it like. Juice Man? Uh, uh, no, I'll send it to you after in the direct message. Okay, but okay. It's, it's very. <laughs> It is very complimentary of his game and makes you think like they signed another guy that's just going to be able to do a lot in the Horizon League. But the point I'm making is that, you know, like I saw it on Twitter, you know, you were in the tag, uh, Jimmy, and people are like, oh, squeezy juice boxes, middle aged man squeezing juice boxes. Like, no, it's a it's a guy who is the ultimate connector of personality there. People are drawn to him and that's why they're signing. Like they have had tremendous success. I know the numbers. I won't say I'm here. But they had a small number of people come to campus for visits, and they closed on, you know, getting eight of them to commit. And so, it didn't take twenty people to get eight. It took, you know, significantly less than that. So the the young men that are coming to campus and talking to the staff are really drawn to what's happening, and they're selling that, you know, from a ground zero starting point. Like this is a three win program that is turning over their entire roster, and yet people are coming in and saying, "This is where I want to be." And really good players like. 
you know, Rich Byrie, Elijah Jones, and Noah Reynolds are saying, this is where I want to be. The the thing yeah. that the thing that for me, I I wish that I wish that Noah Reynolds had been able to decommit from Madison and commit to Green Bay a lot earlier, because maybe they could have even gotten an even higher level of some of these players. Um, but there's nothing but positivity coming from you guys, and that's really what you yeah. need. Well, we were talking about 1969 society raised over a million dollars in less than two months. Not a lot of teams in this league could say they could put that together. Uh, local media is covering, you know, not just Scott from the paper who does a really nice job, but uh, a number of uh, TV people have been covering throughout the post or the off season here in terms of, you know, new players coming to the program. That's what uh, we've been noticing here too. Yeah. With, yeah. With, and then with, uh, with Lundy. So that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. It's a huge thing. And then something for Green Bay, you think about with the best Green Bay teams of the last 15 years, they were really good in Illinois recruiting. And three of the guys that are coming in this class for Green Bay are from the state of Illinois. So they're kind of like relighting that fire in Illinois as well. So I really feel, I mean, if Sundance Wicks can coach at all, and I'm assuming he can, uh, this team is not going to be 2-18 and 18 in the Horizon League. They're going to be significantly better. And I'm glad you brought that up. So I think in... I, I don't know what you're going to say, Jimmy, but I think that the parallels, it, uh, as you know, I'm sure you can refute this, Jimmy, but the parallels between where um, what Wicks is doing in Green Bay, he basically had to start all over again because like everybody, I think everybody except for Amari Jenkins she popped up in the portal one at least once. Um, obviously Wade and, uh, Wade and Cummings are coming back, pull their names out of the portal. But when you compare it to this time last year, when you had basically the same thing going on in Milwaukee and obviously there's a little, it, obviously there's a little bit different vibe, of course, cause you know, you know, like I said, you know, again, just listen to the article, the guy, you know, I'm like, now I see, you know, if you weren't sure why Green Bay hired Sundance Wicks, yeah, I can see it. I can totally see it. The guy is all energy all the time. Um, we're still not sure when he sleeps. <laughs> he, he's but the I, kind of guy that program needs. And a lot of yeah, our programs absolutely. need that. Like there's a there's a salesmanship aspect to a, to a Horizon League job that is needed. I mean, Reach brought it up earlier when he was talking about how the, the Youngstown people – or have responded to Calhoun. Yeah. Um, and, and really, if you can, if you look at it, that's really the difference at a lot of the, the stronger schools of the conference is there, there are people that are, you know, the, the, the university community is responding to them in a way that they haven't done in a while or before at all in the case of like Youngstown. Like it's, I, it's a pretty, it's a pretty big deal. Yeah, I think one of the other things with Green Bay is that you know the last couple of years, notwithstanding, Green Bay has had that history, and we brought it up. With, we brought it up with Wicks during the interview, and he understands that. I think that's extremely important. And if I can make a comparison to that, you know, his kind of tune into uh, the success of Green Bay's past. I think I compare that to an early Dennis Gates who did the same thing. Um, when he hearkened back to the Gary Waters era and the Kevin Mackey era. And I think, you know, Wicks is in the same, I think he's in the same boat as well. And I think he's very cognizant that Green Bay has had, has been a successful program this last few years notwithstanding. And we can get there again. And I think that's, that's extremely important to, to look at that. To your point about that history, if the program was sitting where it normally would be, and where it had been yeah. historically, John Brandon would be the coach at Green Bay right now. That's my opinion. Nobody's told me that for sure. But just to give you, they needed somebody to lift the lift the program in all regards, ticket sales, financial donations, yeah. to look at the facilities and say, yeah, we got a great gym in the Dick Bennett gym, but nobody's put a you know an ounce of paint in there in 15 years. Like Wix is looking at all of these things and bringing them to the attention and getting things done. It's not just about being able to coach basketball and, you know, yeah. this program needed somebody to understand the history and to embrace it and get people really rallied. Is the, um, the Dick Bennett room, is that, is that one court or two courts? It's one full court with two, um, you know, 
two going the other direction. So there's, you can play, you, you, you could get two full courts going, but there's one main court that runs the width yeah. or length of the building. Okay. And that's a, that is a shared facility for university students as well, but it's also the primary home of men's. And also, basketball. also what's what the most important part of that is that green, like they can close off the gym for regular students at pretty much any time if they want. That like is they, correct. They yes. have first right of refusal for for time in that gym. And if the kid, if a kid can't, like, if a kid wants to go get up shots and there's like, I don't know, intramural dodgeball going on, there's somewhere else in the building he can get up shots like without anybody around him. There's another gym with two full basketball courts there, or yeah. four small basketball courts that they can send students to in that scenario. Honestly, the facility need that Green Bay has right now is on the weight room side because the weight room is shared with students and not specific to athletics. So that's probably their big thing that they're moving forward on. And and once they have that, they're going to be in a really good spot again in terms of facility wise matching up to everybody in the league. Um, so and Wicks is one of those guys that. He's he's out there telling people what we need. He's showing yeah. people the difference between what Green Bay has and what Illinois State has and helping people understand like all of it matters. You got to be excellent in all of it, not just parts of it. Yeah. And I, and if I can compare it to that community outreach, I think that in the first couple of years when Jared Calhoun was at Youngstown State, he did the same. It, it looked like he was doing the same thing. Yeah, it, I could see the parallels between coaches, which is which is pretty much testament to me doing this too damn long. <laughs> Um, Harsh, I wanted to bring you into the conversation. What does uh, what does Oakland, uh, what does life after uh, Jalen Moore look like for Oakland? Yeah, it's an interesting topic. Um, we're really struggling to find kind of our star point guard. We have like a, we we brought in Lauren Bowman from Wisconsin uh, last year, and it seemed like he was going to be the successor for Jalen Moore, but. Now you're, you've got guys like DQ Cole who are coming in from JUCO. Uh, you've got guys, and uh, honestly, um, this is going to be a year of just seeing what's what and who's who because um, Oakland is, I mean, you're, you're losing probably the best player you've had in like five years. And it's going to really, it's going to be a transition period. And listening to this conversation, like, I totally cannot relate to, you know, culture changes in terms of coaching and stuff because all we've gone through for the last 40 years is Greg Campy. And you don't really see this invigoration of a program the way that Sundance Wicks is projected to or the way that Bart Lundy has done in um, Milwaukee or the way that uh, Jared Calhoun has done in Youngstown. We've been, it's been the status quo. And it, it's frustrated a lot of people because it's like, well, you are now you're, you're asking a guy who has changed nothing about your culture over the last 40 years to find a guy who is going to lead your team potentially to the NCAA tournament. And because Greg Campy has professed that, you know, the point guard is the most important position, um, it's going to be tough. And it's it, this is going to be a really rough year for Oakland. You just kind of feel it. You think you, you think that they're going to get considerably worse? I think that. Well, first of all, I think that the play itself, the game itself is going to be open up a lot more. But I think that there were games where Jalen Moore was shooting like 30 points. And there were like, especially like against IUPUI in IUPUI, like there was in the last few minutes, it was just getting that last bucket. That, that would have been one of the most epic failures of this team. Yeah, I think they're going to get considerably worse. Wow. Well, I, 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 I wanted to I wanted to say this um, before is that we were talking about like could this be like a year where the Horizon League takes a big jump up and I hope it is, but yeah. I, I wanted to say that that we did take a jump up this last year. This last year was a big jump up for the conference. Um, pre the in the previous year we were I believe twenty seventh or twenty eighth in the Sagarin ratings for conferences, and this past year in twenty twenty two twenty three. The Horizon League was 20th in the Sagarin rating. So we went up seven or eight spots, despite the fact that we had IUPUI and Green Bay, who are two of the 10 worst programs in, in the Sagarin ratings, or worst 15, some of the worst, two of the worst in the, in the country. So and it, despite really that, and seeing, you know, seeing if Green Bay can have this, um, you know, it can have this big 
renaissance that this immediate renaissance that they're hoping for and talking you know talking up they can have that maybe the horizon league makes that makes another jump maybe you know maybe it's not a jump to you know 15th or 14th or something but i don't i don't think that i think oakland fans because they haven't won the a conference title um, besides the regular season title that one year, I, th- I yeah. think that a lot of them look at Campy and think this guy is almost 70 years old. It's time to move on. It's time to have one of these like exciting young guys, like is that Youngstown or Green Bay or Milwaukee or what exactly. have you. Yeah. And, so, so, sorry, Jimmy, I just wanted to no, say something. Ahead. Um, just looking at the coaches that are currently in the horizon, let's let, let's let, let's kind of list them off. I don't want to like bore you guys to death, but let's let's no, start with, no. with let's start with Detroit. You're literally I, talking to the people who uh, like breathe this stuff. Go ahead, you're fine. <laughs> I mean, you, we're we're literally almost two episodes into this. Fire away, man! Fire away. So let's start with uh, the Metro Series rival in Detroit. Mike Davis is an assist, was an associate head coach at Alabama. They're at Quad One program. And Alabama has shown that they can be a number one seed. Then you want to go, let's go to Northern Kentucky and let's talk about Darren Horn. Darren Horn was a head coach at South Carolina, another SEC program. As we all know that that wasn't exactly the biggest success, but then he went to Texas and worked under Shaka. And so you're seeing all these guys, like even Sundance Wicks, he came from Wyoming. The only guy in the last five years who was hired that wasn't from like a big school was Bart Lundy. And that turned out to be a lightning in a bottle higher. And you guys are all super happy with the way that's turned out. But we have had the same guy here for the last 40 years. And, I mean, Campy came from Bowling Green. I mean, but this is before Bowling Green was Bowling Green. So you're seeing this influx of, like, great coaches coming. Even let's talk about Jared Calhoun. He coached under Bob Huggins in West Virginia. Like, that, like Huggy Bear is legendary. And we all love Huggy Bear. Um, but you, I guess as Oakland fans were like, we're kind of falling behind the curve of like all these new coaches that are coming in that have come from pretty decent programs, like quad one programs, even if they're not successful, you know what that level of competition is like, and you know what that complexity is like in terms of the. Yeah, I would argue, I would argue against the get a coach from a successful high major. Milwaukee's last six head coaches. You had three coaches who were lower division head coaches that were successful, and you had three guys who were hired that were high major assistant coaches. Uh, you had Rob Jeter was a high major assistant coach at, at Madison. He had been an assistant here. He played for Bo, at, Bo Ryan at uh, Platteville. You had Pat Baldwin Sr., and you had Laval Jordan, who had been an assistant at Michigan. And None of those guys succeeded at the level the fans wanted. Um, anybody who knows me knows that I will argue to the death for Rob Jeter. Uh, if that guy wanted me to walk through hell, I would do that for him. Um, but really, the three coaches that we had were who were lower division head, successful head coaches were just now Bart Lundy. Bruce Pearl and Bo Ryan. But Bruce Clearly, Pearl also coached at, didn't he also coach at like Tennessee? I think that's where you're going with it. So no, what I'm saying is that Bruce Pearl was the coach at Southern Indiana in Division Two for a lot for like ten years. He won, uh, I think it was one or two national championships in Division Two, and then he became our head coach when Bo Ryan left for Madison, and he didn't he didn't coach he left us for Tennessee. Bruce Pearl yeah. took us to the Sweet 16 and then went to Tennessee. My my point is, if you're looking at these guys who are like great leg assistants in Division One, I I don't I don't think that alone is it. I, I think you have to have somebody who is successful as a head coach. Now you bring hey, up Jimmy. Darren, you bring up Darren Horn, but Darren Horn was successful before he was the head coach at South Carolina. Where was he successful? Everybody, you know, well, like. Western Kentucky, which is a similar, you know, similar level program to Northern Kentucky. Um, there's a little more, there's a lot more history, a lot more, you know, maybe, maybe a lot more money flowing towards Western, but 
the point is that he was a successful coach, so clearly he could succeed here. So, hey, Jimmy, when I think of Greg Campy and, and Oakland or, you know, the ne- whenever Coach Campy retires and they go on to the next person, like one thing that's really held Oakland back in my mind, you you have to have dudes, right? You have to have high-level players to win in this game. You have to have the Marquez, Marquez Warwick types. You need a Jalen Moore type to win. If you don't have a dude, you can't you can't win. But with that said, you have to be able to manage your dudes so that they're healthy at the end of the season. And one place where I think if I had a critique of Coach Campy and how he manages Oakland's team, he runs his six main guys into the ground, like their yeah. style and the pace yeah. that they play. Yeah, he has it, no bench. So they've kind of no fallen. You know, when it matters the most, they're the beat. They're as beat up as they've been, and oh, yeah. the rest of the league. It, it has more depth or manages that better. And I just feel like that's really my biggest knock on coach Campy or whoever's going to take over. Like you, you can't just run six guys into the ground. So here's my other question for you. I my, here's my other question for you. And this is actually important because we get, because that's again, to your point at a certain point in time, Oakland has to think about life after Greg Campy. But when you look at Oakland and I know Matt and I have had a conversation about multiple conversations about this, what is going to be the price point for that new head coach? And is there going to be any upgrade of any facilities within Oakland? Because that has been an issue perpetually, as you probably well know. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that's a big issue. I, I think those are two questions that need to be asked. Um, Cause that, that could be, that could make things worse if it, by being honest. Well, I th- I think Oakland's taking some steps in the right direction. They got the naming rights. Uh, they get the naming rights to uh, uh, Oakland's credit union, so they are going to get a little bit of an influx of cash, which I hope they put towards improving the facilities. Um, as far as your question regarding uh, life after Greg Campy, I think that the only logical thing for for Greg Campy's fate is he's going to retire, and I think the stipulations are going to be he's going to have his hand in that pie of who he wants to be his successor. And what my worry is, is that it's going to be one of the people who's currently on his staff. And Tony not- Jones, dude, get Tony Jones. Yeah. I, as, as much as I would love coach Tony, I, you know, I've, I've talked to coach Tony, love, love the guy. And he, he would be that guy. I mean, if we're, if we're going to continue this point, he coached under Bruce Pearl at Tennessee. Um, they had relatively decent success. He would, he would be the guy. But what my worry is is that they're gonna that they're not even gonna try to look from uh, the outside. I mean, uh, logically, you'd probably get a few outside high, uh, candidates, but I don't think they're gonna take um, any drastic changes um, that Greg Campy would not kind of approve of. And that's I mean that's a worry that if a guy wants to keep a status quo now as the head coach, he's probably gonna want to get a guy as a successor who's going to, you know, maintain the same culture and the same scheme as, as he has professed in the last four years. You know, one thing about Oakland, though, they have had a lot of success, separate of their facility being not like, it's a great place. It's a great environment. It's not a great place. If you understand that, you know, can say the difference, like there's nothing special about the building, but because it's yeah. small and tight, it's fun to go watch a game there. But they've had a lot of success just getting guys to come back to Michigan. I mean, you think about how many people live in the state of Michigan, how many are in the greater Detroit area. Like whoever, you don't need to have all the bells and whistles. You just need to have the pulse on getting guys to come back. When they're coming back to Michigan, have your finger on being able to get them. We've seen Eastern kind of taking over a little bit. They brought a bunch of guys back last year that had gone other places that maybe would have previously gone to Oakland in the past. Or you look at Detroit with coach Davis, he, everybody he gets is from the South, Texas, Alabama. They all have, he has had very little success bringing guys back to Detroit. And so whoever, when it's time for uh, coach Champy to retire, when he decides to do that, whoever takes over, just has to have a really good pulse on how to get those local guys to come back. And you'll be able to maintain a certain level of success, even with a high school gym as their primary venue. <laughs> And I think with that, I think we're going to go ahead and close this out. Guys, thank you once again. You know what? We didn't even talk about Cleveland State. You know what? I'm very sad about that. That's Nobody okay. wants to talk about Cleveland State. Bob. Nobody in Cleveland wants to talk about Cleveland State. Duh. I don't even know. If, does, is John even on the call anymore? He left like a half an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like he was driving. 
I mean, I don't know. Was he? I, I think he got pulled over. That was what that siren that we heard was. So he, he definitely hey, was driving we, when he was talking. No, the siren yeah, we, was we at have, my house. Have, yeah, that's true. There was a, the siren was at Jimmy's the, house. They were coming yeah, to take. They were in, coming to te- finally take Jimmy away. I live um, in the the hood of Hills Corners, Wisconsin. Yeah, right. I think I think uh, you're not a, you're not you're not uh, actively you're not actively in like a uh, um, in siege mode, are you, Jimmy? Because that would be bad. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not under siege. You're, you're not. Moment. You're not like flipping between us and a negotiator from the uh, uh, from the police department because that would be bad. Yeah, I gotta go get my hair cut because it looks pretty ridiculous. Yeah, we know. <laughs> Bob, we sent our negotiator to get to Jimmy to sign up for the 1969 Society. He's over there talking dollars and cents right now. You're just Sundance yeah. Wicks is already in my DMs. There you go. All he, right. just, he heard he heard through the grapevine and he's on top of it. He brought the juice yeah. is really what's uh, what's going. He he brought the juice. I'll have to I'll have to address the Cleveland State thing on my own at some point. But anyway, that's going to leave it. I'm, I'm going to. I, there's no way. That's all right. Nobody's going to fucking listen to me anyway. So it doesn't matter. So let's uh, close this out. All right. So uh, thank you guys all once again for joining us. Um, yeah. Hate to end on a downer, but the downer is this is the end. So the, 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 there is a better future ahead of us that does not include this battle royale. And I'm totally fine yep. with that. Maybe maybe this battle royale is the reason that Horizon League became a worse conference, and ending it is the only thing we could do. To Are you implying that we're shitty fans, Jimmy? Is that what you're implying? I'm not implying anything. I'm explicitly saying we all suck. <laughs> <laughs> all right, good. All right, so. Oh, well. Anyway, we'll we'll go back to our regular. Yeah, we got we actually do have some things that are going on this summer. Um, they're also. Um, crossing fingers, uh, looking to, looking to get Darren Horn on, uh, but HorizonRoundtable.com. Be on the lookout for that. Uh, and of course, you can pull us up wherever podcasts are found. And of course, you can find us uh, where, on your uh, Google or Amazon devices. So until next time, um, thank you for listening. <laughs>